Thanks, Greg. And hi from me as well. So my name is Sam. I'm the head of programs at Smart School Councils. I, I was a, a primary school teacher, which is my background. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's been a weird turn for us as, as well as, as, as you guys in school. So uh, it's, it's good to be able to end it on a really high note. Um, and what we're also going to do, well, let me just run you through the agenda and then we'll introduce you to our two guest speakers as well today who are joining us. So uh, very quickly, then what are we doing in our 45 minutes? Well, um, for lots of us on this call we are not members of Smart School Council we might not know much about what it is so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that and then we move on to our kind of the purpose of what, why we're together this afternoon which is to learn about how a Smart School Council involves voices that are often marginalized from getting involved in pupil voice and often in settings that aren't mainstream if you want to use that term. Uh, thirdly we're going to hear directly from teachers in alternative provision settings but they're going to introduce themselves to you in a moment and then finally we're to get some tips and ask questions of them. So with that in mind, let's introduce them. Uh, can I come to you first, Faye? Is that okay? Do you want to just let us know who you are? You're on mute, Faye. Faye. Oh yeah, good point. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I am a teacher or lead at uh, Key Stage 2. We are an SEMH school for boys. Uh, we have boys from year three up to year 11, um, all with various difficulties and needs. Um, but we also have a, a section in a local college. So we have a hub in our local college, which some of our boys will go to or use um, as well. So we're over a couple of sites. Brilliant. Thanks um, very much. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a great intro. Thank you. We'll, we'll hear more about uh, Little Green Academy and, and what you guys are up to in a little while. Thank you for that. And then Phil is our other uh, guest speaker today. Um, Phil, uh, never a man uh, that is wanting an introduction because you give yourself a great bill. So yeah, tell us all about you, Phil. Okay, so my name is Phil Arnold. I work at Alpha Oldham. Um, so we, we look after around about eight um, schools. Uh, I've worked particularly with the SEMH schools and the Proves in the area. Uh, my kind of job is a assistant CEO, um, and then I'm a trust partner then to a uh, number of schools. So that's me. Phil, that was the shortest introduction I've ever heard you give, uh, <laughs> but I, I like it. That was good. Uh, on, we'll give you more time. To talk. Uh, yeah, no, you are. I can appre I appreciate that very much. Thanks, Phil. Uh, okay, so uh, Faye and Phil are going to be, I guess, um, yeah, yeah. Well, talking us yeah. through what their experiences are in uh, in their settings and how it is that they get their young people involved in pupil voice and, and get as many of them, all of them involved, which is kind of what we're all about. So let's just talk very quickly about us then as a charity, uh, if you wouldn't mind skipping on. So thanks, Greg. Uh, so we were established in uh, 2014 by uh, a youth worker uh, whose name was Asher, and then by Greg, who's got a background as a policy advisor for the DfE, although he uh, doesn't want you to hold that against him. Uh, our mission is to help every child lead change through pupil voice and democracy. How do we do this? Well, we have a core program uh, that is for uh, schools in in various settings to include every young person in sharing their voice. Uh, we've got 360 member schools who are on our program, uh, not just in the UK as that map shows, but broadly speaking, we're in the UK. And the types of schools that we work with are primary, secondary, proves, SEN, and a few international schools as well. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get uh, all of the schools we work with to a position where their young people are leading change and using their voice through school councils and through democracy. Now, this is an aim that I think all schools have. It's a universal aim. And there are a phenomenal uh, amount of ways of doing it. But from our perspective, and um, the way that often schools do it could be improved. Why do we think it could be improved? Well, uh, we think it could be improved because of these sorts of concerns, and these are the sorts of concerns that we come across quite frequently when we talk to teachers, um, that when they are setting up their pupil voice structures, they uh, have the same things that come up every year, and that can be, become sort of demotivating. Uh, they start them in September and they run out by Christmas. Uh, they are too paper-based, and when you're working with a generation who is sort of digital literate, that can be a barrier sometimes. Um, often 
and their pupil voice structures are too teacher-led and therefore not very organic for the students themselves. And then I guess the fifth concern that lots of teachers have is the one we're going to spend most time talking about today, which is that pupil voice and getting involved in making a difference often only involves the usual suspects. And that shouldn't be the case. Well, why shouldn't that be the case? Uh, we've got some research that we uh, sort of use as uh, evidence for why uh, a charity like ours should exist. The Children's Commissioner a few years ago did some research and said that only two in five pupils think that this school council listens to them, which is simply not good enough. Uh, and there is also some really interesting research that the University of Roehampton has done around advantage or disadvantage, I guess, and how that affects a young person's likelihood of getting involved in things like democracy. So people with more than 200 books at home, 62% of those vote in school council elections, whereas with those with fewer than 10 books, there's a significant drop in the number who get involved. And um, so this is the sort of the, the environmental background behind what we try to do as a charity, which is ultimately getting everybody involved. That's the one thing that we're trying to do. And what we're talking today about is how we can get all young people involved in pupil voice in settings which maybe that's even more of a challenge than it might be in other schools. Um, so very quickly again from me, this is how we try to achieve it. Our core programme is uh, explained through this graphic. Uh, there are three parts or three elements of a smart school council. Class meetings uh, that uh, give everybody a voice in, in, in classes that are, are done weekly, fortnightly, monthly through our digital tool and, and run, are led by two pupils themselves. Uh, action teams that enable everybody to lead change. So this could be um, a campaign to make a difference. It could be about changing the school environment, whatever. Genuine pupil-led initiatives. And then thirdly, the uh, communications team, which is a, I guess it's a bit like the traditional school council. A group of young people who have a leadership responsibility, only their job this time isn't to represent other people, which is part of the barrier to the most marginalized young people getting involved. Their job is instead to help everybody get involved and to lead in making sure everybody gets through and into the program. So um, what does this look like in, in reality? Uh, so I guess there are three things that we try to do. We try to involve every voice. We try to open social action up to new students. And we want to make sure that the program itself is led by students. So in reality, Involving every voice looks like getting everybody involved in pupil-led class meetings. Um, opening up social action uh, looks like clubs and activities run by people who don't traditionally get involved. And then having it genuinely student-led as an initiative is all about the communication team who are running it rather than teachers running it themselves, which saves time and effort. That's a whistle stop tour, a whistle stop tour, folks, into uh, our program. For those of you who maybe are joining us for the first time or aren't so aware of it, if you want to know more about our program, uh, please let us know in the comment box and we will be able to share lots of resources with you. So, for now, let's go to then look at how this works particularly in uh, settings where inclusion is maybe more of a focus than it may otherwise be in sort of mainstream schools. So let's go to you, Faye, first, if that's okay to start off with. Um, we've heard a little bit about your sort of school. Maybe do you want to sort of t tell us a little bit about sort of um, your pupils, who you serve, and, uh, and then we'll start to ask you a few questions then about sort of why you came on board with the Smart School Councils. Yeah, um, our pupils, uh, we're based in West Sussex, so, um, and our pupils can travel maybe up to an hour and a half in a taxi every morning to come to our school and leave. So, and they mainly in their, their own taxis uh, coming to our school each day. Um, so they all have issues with social and communication. So having a school council trying to meet just the basics of trying to get cover for a teacher to be able to run that was just never happening. And um, when I first joined the school, it, we just, the meetings would be back booked in once a term or half a term. And then you'd sort of, when it came down to it, the teacher would not be able to get cover or the pupils weren't in a point. And to think that we could put a group of pupils into a room together and expect them to have the skills to communicate when there's a reason why they're at our school. So um, when I got given the role um, as school council two years ago, I started to look for something different and just to look to see what was out there. 
and um, I came across Smart School Council and uh, it was perfect um, for include, I, I really liked the idea of that it wasn't about a small group of boys coming, trying to come together to make decisions and to communicate and I really liked the way that it was about everyone giving everyone a voice and that kind of sold it straight to me and um, just knowing that when I first started there was someone at the end of the phone <laughs> all the time for me when I was like I've done this but I'm not sure that, you know to help me with the technical side of actually starting it up was really useful nice. and um, yeah oh, go on no go on oh, yeah. That's, yeah that's what okay. I was gonna say Thanks, Faye. That's yeah. That's a really great introduction. We'll come back to you in a second, but thank you for that. So, same two questions to you then, Phil, if that's okay. So, tell us a bit about the students that you work with, and then sort of what your link is with, with Smart School Councils as well. Okay. So, um, the type of students that we work with are SEMH. So, we we take them from um, Key Stage One all the way through to Key Stage Five, um, and it's it's really um, the provisions kind of bespoke around the needs of those young people. Um, we have, as you can see, so I've got another high school behind me here, which is, you know, uh, picks up uh, autistic kids, so a full, full range of communication. And if you look, everybody's going home, including the head teachers, it's only basically me here and the caretakers. Um, I've got another school just over my shoulder, that's a new bridge. So that's, that has um, another 400 and odd kids in. So the units that I tend to work in are normally uh, 40, 50 children. Um, so a lot smaller, um, kind of isolated, I, I would guess. Um, from being a uh, used to being working in a mainstream high school um, so it's how do you get those levels of communication those interactions with people that often struggle with that so I guess the kind of um, attraction really to smart schools council we're looking at people that are often on the fringes of society so therefore how do we build social capital and how do we give them an experience of a lived democracy so that's an opportunity that the smart schools council provide really strongly um, a lot of the curriculum is co-constructed so how do we shape a curriculum around the needs of those young people and construct that with them so you know using kind of technology has been mentioned so every every child has their own ipad we have a one-to-one -one kind of project here so enhancing what we do by the use of modern technology is the way to go um, embedding that learning in real world settings is something that we want to do so there's no good just doing something in school for the sake of doing it in school and it has no value outside of that context mm. um and I guess a real keen thing is around agency. So a lot of young people want to engage and do engage, but don't engage positively in many situations. So how do you build up both that sense of agency within those relationships and it relating to positive actions then within society? And my last one on my list um, is the kind of social justice, justice aspect of it. So how do you empower people to come up with something that's a solution that they can do and they can take a lead on? And I think all of those things, the kind of model of Smart Schools Council and the way that it's set up and the way that it's engineered allows young people to engage in such a positive way. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, that, that's really useful to hear and, and, and a fantastic intro to what you guys are up to uh, with the programme. So um, I've got two other questions but that I want to make sure we get across. I ask one to you, Faye, and then the other one to you, Phil. So Faye, tell us a little bit, if you would, about sort of, yeah, that process of, of taking over the role and then finding the Smart School Councils and kind of how you started the process from there on. So, yeah, I um, it was inset day, September, and it was Right, fresh start of the year, introduced it to the staff um, and kind of gave them an overview, used your PowerPoints and just introduced it, the concept of that everyone's involved now, everyone has a voice. Um, and I think it was really easy to sell because I think it's exactly what um, the schools is about and what we want. Um, so it wasn't, it was actually really easy to um, sell really. It was, um, everyone was on board. And um, we just start with the class meetings. The class meetings were is such a valuable thing to start with and just to see the changes. Because we were going through becoming an academy at the time. Mm. So there's lots of changes happening, but they could have a, a chance to have a say about the changes. So we got, for example, um, the academy wanted to introduce, introduce teams. We've never had teams. So the boys got to choose the categories and then they got to choose the team names and the colours and you know they could really see and that is, mm. is why we have an all blue PE kit because they chose all blue um, um, none of us would have chosen all blue but boys <laughs> wanted all blue so they've got all blue and but they can see that they can make those choices and it happens 
and we okay. stick to it. So what we say, you know, when we ask them, result comes out and they see that that's what happens. We don't just go, oh, thanks for your, thanks for your answers, but we're going to go with what we thought anyway. <laughs> I think that was really nice that they yeah. can generally see, trust us that when, if they make a decision, it has, something will change. Mm. Yeah, that's, I think that's hugely valuable, isn't it? And I think that we'll, we'll sort of come back to that, if that's okay, when we look at class meetings in a moment and how you guys uh, work and, and operate them. But that, yeah, that's, I think that's so important. Um, and then, so Phil, to you, so you guys are kind of looking, you're going through a big sort of review at the moment, aren't you, as a trust into sort of pupil voice. So maybe this question is good for you. Like what, sort of, what are the obstacles that your young people and, and uh, some of them are older, I guess, uh, face when sort of getting involved in pupil voice and, and what it, how is it that you're using sort of your review and our programme to overcome those, if you could? Yeah, um, so I guess it's, it's the way that this fits in with your school development strategy. So for us, that area around pupil voice is something that um, could be easily, if you like, just ignored, really. So you can tick the box and say that we have pupil councils. Um, but actually, it's one of our key drivers. That if we can engage young people in shaping the offer around them, then we can have that kind of um, ultimate impact that we want to have for those children and young people. So, so for us, we're right at the beginning of this process. So Greg's been and done the kind of masterclass which is the, you know, the classic reframing challenge. To be able to say, don't do that, do this instead. You'll find it a lot easier and it just works so well and it impacts so well. And you kind of have to trust that that, that is the, the right kind of jump off point for that. Um, mm. And then kind of working through, I guess, obstacles, the way that the manual's set up and the way that it works, it tends to chunk all those up into really manageable steps. So it's not to worry about everything just to kind of progress your way through that manual. So I guess we're at the start small stage and looking to identify those leaders both within the pupil cohorts and within the, the kind of staff cohorts to be able to just take on those initial challenges and to start to generate that enthusiasm around it that things can change and it can be different and mm. it does hold the value then to us all. Great. Okay. Thanks, Phil. I really appreciate that. And I, and I hope that for, for all of our teachers or staff uh, uh, who are joining us, and um, that's given a real grounding in sort of where, you're, where you are at, what your settings are, and what you're sort of, you have achieved and what you're trying to develop. So, so the big question for us is, is about inclusion then, isn't it? And so what we do to make sure that marginalised, disadvantaged, or um, voices that aren't typically heard, what do we do or what, in this case, what do you guys do? To make sure that happens so one of the ways i guess one of the main ways that we get all voices involved is through class meetings now i wondered if we could go back to this with you faye and you tell us a little bit about sort of how you run class meetings in little green uh, academy what they look like and yeah tell us how your students find them and a bit of sort of the sort of impact like you mentioned earlier on with the uniform would be really great yeah, so we're only, uh, we're a small school, so we only have maybe 70 pupils at the most in our school. So what we use is instead of groups, they do it individually. So they do it as a uh, one per, uh, pupil instead of, so when it asks you um, how many groups, we don't have the group situation. So we, we always, they're all individuals. So they all have their own chance to um, say what they want or which option they would like. Um, and up until it's been myself setting the questions, um, but using input from other teachers. So even from being able to find out if the boys feel safe at school, and that was really a valuable thing to be able to just put some questions out there, maybe four questions over a period of four weeks, just asking how safe they feel in different parts of the school. Um, and that was a, a really nice way to be able to find out and using their comments as well to back up that and what, how safe they feel and to be able to look at making them feel safer if they don't. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, it's been um, a big, a tool, really useful tool with the changes because our pupils do struggle with change and things being different. And so I'd say the one thing that I have always used is the word pupil voice. So I haven't used um, Smart School Council. I've always put over just because for them, and especially if they're, with their autism, they need to see the same visual. So they see that a pupil voice is there, their, their chance to have a say, and making that really clear from the start that it was always used, and we always use that term, has always been key throughout. Mm. And I think that's what's really helped them to sort of understand what it's about, and kind of helping them to understand the concept of, because I don't think they ever understood what a school or what school council is. 
Mm. They're not work, council isn't a word that they can really kind of understand or hold on to, whereas a voice and that they, they know themselves as pupils. So I think that's just sort of the basics really help with their understanding and concept of it. Um, yeah, and I think just at the moment we have, especially at, no, at the moment we're in pods, so we don't see other pupils. We don't see um, the boys that are at college. So this is a one way class meeting is that they all get to um, have a say and hear what other people are saying. So the boys that are at college, the boys that are in the separate pod, they know at some point that week they'll all be discussing that question and then they all get to see the results. And they really love seeing, oh, we're the fourth class to do it, or we're the fifth class to do it. And they can see that, and that visual aid is really good for the, our boys. Nice, and so, so you, rather than having in groups, like you said, you've got sort of individual votes, which I guess um, is, is, is something that you've adjusted, I guess, or changed about the structure to make it, yeah. um, to make it better for them to access. Do you wanna just tell us a bit about sort of why or why it works better for them like, in that way? Um, I think purely because of the number of boys, may, the most we only have is seven boys in the classroom. So just having those and for them to be able to have to agree with someone is very difficult. And so being able to just be able to say what they, their choice and why is a huge step for some of ours. Just being able to choose one thing is big. For some, they can actually say why. And another uh, obstacle is uh, they have to listen to someone else's view. They don't have to agree with it, but they have to listen to it. And so, and all those are quite big things for our boys. So we thought that actually keeping it so that they still get their individual vote mm. was important for them. Um, and then they get that chance. And so they can agree to disagree with the people in the class, but they still get their own individual uh, vote. And I think as, it, as you see it, as you walk through the school, um, for me in the youngest when I do all the typing I ask the question um, uh, and I do I run it with them so when as it moves up the school you can see the change in that the boys are starting to run it they're able mm. to type they're able to hold themselves and have the confidence to you know give it a go read out the question is mm. big so and that's, that's cool. all really really useful skills and they're the little things that we just you don't even think about it as part of what we're working on it all the time mm. that sort of speaking and listening mm. that's cool yeah that's those i think those are really like valuable things to highlight aren't they sort of um making sure that you've got like a differentiated level of participation so when they're able to they can run the meeting themselves but until they're able to then maybe that's something the staff will do i really liked your comment about a sort of the branding as well as saying well we what we need for them is something that's not abstract and something that they recognize i think that's a really good and useful tip as well for working with students like those so yeah amazing day thank you thank you for that um so let Yes. I mean, Phil, do you want to add anything very quickly into sort of your plans with class meetings for, for your for your group? No, I just think it's just consistency. I would agree is really helpful. So the teacher, all that they basically got to do is open up a link on an email. And then the more that you can put the young people in charge of that process, the better that becomes. Um, it's the same in every classroom. And therefore, everybody gets used to it. It's a really low friction way of introducing something that's different. Um, they enjoy the way that it just kind of focuses, if you like, a conversation with a countdown kind of um, options that you can put on it. So mm. it's often really timely and getting the feedback instantly. You know, if you're working across multi sites or you want to ask something that's a little bit more complicated, it's a really good way of just taking that um, out to people and getting feedback straight away. So, you know, it can be done as often or, you know, uh, as infrequently as you want to do it to be able to drive that kind of action forward from the classes but i think as soon as you start to see something change as a result of a discussion mm. you know, that kind of feedback really empowers that engagement mm. thanks phil yeah thank you very much for that okay let's um let's move on uh um let's have a look what we've what, what we got coming up next greg because you've got the slides there ah right action teams so these are our sort of social action points um and i think that it's fair to say if we go to you first favorite uh, and you've had some sort of um mixed experiences with action teams in the school so far haven't you um but i think it would be really good to just to get like an honest assessment of of what how you found it what what things have worked well what haven't worked well i think that would be really valuable for for the people listening 
Yeah, I think that um, I went in, I, I was like, right, I was selling, you know, this is what's going to happen. And um, the boys are going to um, create these, get together in these groups and they're going to create these teams and stuff. And actually, what I realised and what is working and what works is that, for example, two weeks ago, I was on a cross country walk with a boy and it, just chatting and he likes comic books. So, right, okay, I don't know much about comic books, but I know a teacher that does. And so to be able to put those two people together, to be able to then create a comic book club or get some comics books put into our library mm. is the way forward. So it's those not thinking, it's about finding that interest that that boy will come to you or that uh, people will come to you with something that they enjoy. And, and, and there might be other pupils that enjoy it, but even if for our school, if it's just a, a one pupil that enjoys that, working with another adult to make that happen is really, really great. So, and as a result of action teams, we have chickens in our school um, that um, uh, that uh, roam around. So we have five chickens because there was a boy that really thought we needed some kind of animals at our school, and um, and we did, and we did, and we've got, and so. Having someone that actually knew about chickens and so we we're lucky that a TA, we have lots of TAs that, you know, with all the different skills and different interests, you can find someone that will work with that pupil. Maybe yeah. they've never worked together, but it actually brings them together to bring the, with a common interest. And that's how it works. Or we've had it where we've got, a, we're starting up a farm and the guy that's coming in to start up the farm, he's looking for people, for pupils to help him but they need to have that interest so again it would be like mini action teams setting up these farms and finding the pupils that have a, this interest or something that they would like nice. to introduce to the school that's cool make the school and big sorry yeah sorry go on. and how do you how do you support that i guess is my question for you like as far as staff is concerned so you've got your student who really likes chickens or you've got people who, who want to get involved in the farm project that like what it how is it that it works with for you in your setting so i i've been really lucky that with um with we have set up a an after school uh, football club and our caretaker and they just he just went with it with them um, because we're not worrying about paper like filling in the forms we don't because of that would be a barrier for us it's a case of them two working together and they just sort of um and all of a sudden you sort of see these letters going out to parents about a football club and also there's something about a football kit and so they're just quietly getting on with it in the background and starting to introduce pupils to it when as and when we needed it didn't work for us having a group of pupils come together with an idea Mm. It was very much an individual time for boy for people to work with someone to then, and then once it's established, then bringing in other pupils. But again, that's because of uh, the you know it's um, a barrier in terms of their social uh, interaction with other pupils is hard. So actually, working giving them a chance to work with someone, and they. Our pupils love having that attention from an adult or a member of staff or a governor, anyone mm. that's interested. Because if you think about the whole community with all this, there will, you will be able to find someone with that interest, whether it's a parent, a governor, a TA, maintenance, the cook, there'll be somebody that will have an interest in that. And you just got to put them together and then it'll, because they both have an interest in it, it just happens, which is really nice. Cool. Uh, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, my partner's a big fan of chickens and she keeps telling me about how intelligent they are and how we should have them, but I'm not sold. Uh, so maybe I'll talk to you about that later on, Faye. Uh, but yeah, that sounds really good. Thank you. And then Phil, I mean, again, so you, you're on the beginning of this process, aren't you, with your group? So um, how do you envisage sort of action teams working for you guys? Yeah, I, I, I would echo a lot of that. So having done this in other places, in Peru's and in mainstream schools, I think go with the energy of others. So quite often we come in with our own agenda, particularly SLT have their own agenda of things that they like to see happen in a certain order and it doesn't get delivered because it's not delivered with the energy of others. Uh, keep it really simple will probably be my second one. The simpler it is, the more likely it is to happen. And everybody gets really good at pitching ideas at each other that are just really simple and really build on what's possible. Um, and probably the third one, just to echo, is network, network, network. So it doesn't matter whether you're able to deliver that, there'll be somebody that knows something about it. And that might be within the community, building links within the community. It might be, you know, a contact within one of the families that that's what they do. You know, we were looking at a project to get some fish in school, you know, and it just so happened that somebody had a fish tank, you know, that they weren't using. 
another person was breeding fish uh, the local uh, pet shop donated all the rest of the stuff so we, within like you know 12 hours actually there was fish on the inside of the school it all just came together now if we tried to do that you know as an executive team with a senior leadership team it would have taken us weeks so really those kind of action teams can produce really uh, affirmative action really quickly and deliver really well as long as you kind of stick with those keep it simple rules yeah i agree with that completely i think those are really uh, useful and i think uh, yeah really focused way of, of looking at how you might get um students like the ones we're talking about involved in action teams and, and that sort of bespoke way i think is useful thanks phil okay so we've got the third and, and final bit of our uh, our uh, model to talk about and i recognize that for this one i think it might be hardest for our guests to talk about because Faye, you've already mentioned that um a lot of the sort of the cogs of your working smart school council kind of depends upon you uh, and some of your staff members and um, so yeah do, do you want to just talk about sort of what you have tried with the, the leadership group the communications team or what your aspirations might be or or, or even what why it doesn't quite it doesn't quite work with it with your setting yeah i'd say that when i first started um and i sort of got together the communications team all of a sudden i felt like i'd gone back towards the old school kind of pupil voice system where I was bringing a group of trying to get a group of boys together to try and do something and even though it's in a different way it for us it what didn't work but a communication team I see it as one pupil going and see the head with a result of a class meeting is a big um, way of communicating and a, you know and that's where how we use it so our communication team is about more about you know oh would you like to go and tell uh, Louise our head that the boys want this or that you want this or if it's something to do you know the boys going and telling them that they started up this or they've done this so we've got a Dungeons and Dragons club and you know there's four boys in it and let's have it you know and that and that's where I think because I, I think there's also a big thing and our boys don't always like big recognition they struggle with praise they mm. struggle with yeah so you know just those small actions and I think, as you say, it's, as Phil said, it's keeping it simple. And as I said, I think the key, biggest way we communicate is just by people being able to go or be, put it in the newsletter. So our, uh, the, the newsletter that goes out each week, there'll be a little bit in there that will say what the result was of our class meeting that week. So, um, and I think the boys see it. I think when they see something, hang on a minute, we've got a football team. That's, yeah that's thanks to Jake because he set that up with Mr. Floyd. So, and that's how, and that, hang on a minute, we've got, you know, and so they will see the, that happening because a lot of time when you talk to them about it, you know, it might be that something might have happened, but when they visually see that change and that's how I think the communication works through the visual seeing of the changes and being part of it when they've actually had a chance to be part of that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's yeah, that's really sage advice. I think, isn't it? You know, because often we can talk about communications team as these great big functioning things with lots of cogs and different elements, but ultimately it's about the small actions, isn't it? It's about you know, like you said, going to see the head or having that sense of ownership or responsibility over an idea. And if we're still getting those small senses of achievement, those small actions through, then that's that's what a communications team is. And there's no reason why we can't do that. Um, that's yeah. Thanks, Faye. That's really good. And then I'll, I'll just go to you again, Phil, for your for your um, your input on on comms teams and what that has looked like in the past for you, or what it might look like in the future. I, th I think we we all know uh, groups of children that we work with, uh, young people that are just absolutely fantastic. They just get stuff, and they get stuff uh, um, from other people, and they just understand it straight away. And um, quite often, they have a lot more time than the staff do. So they don't mind pursuing things through their break time, through their dinner time and, and out of school activities. Um, and they kind of get the impact that they want to create, as we would say in offset terms, or they sort of know the difference that they want to make. So they know they want to change the world for the better or they want to do something positive, but they often kind of don't understand um, how well they use their skills because they're not often asked to share them. And I think what the communication team does, it allows those uh, children, young people that are good at being with others and understanding these things and having the time and and really that resilience to make a difference and sharing those behaviors and modeling those behaviors with other people to create a culture shift 
And that's quite interesting for them, isn't it? That if you stop them and, and kind of work with them to be able to say, did you realise what you did then? That was absolutely fantastic because, you know, that's your job really to coach them and uh, mentor those young people to explore their own skills, but also give them the opportunity of passing those to others. So it's a wonderful opportunity, the cons team, to be involved in, particularly mm. if you're kind of breaking it down into what you want them to be able to achieve as young people in their lives. And these are where these skills are going to put in. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I think that's really good. And just a point to raise from Sarah Jane as well that's coming through in the comments that says that these are also opportunities uh, for young people to build relationships with, with sort of adults and other people in their schools, maybe that the sorts of relationships they wouldn't normally have, the sorts of relationships that they might build with a head teacher or whoever it might be, that means that they feel a better sense of their place in that school uh, or that environment. So thanks for that, Sarah Jane. I think that's a really valuable comment as well. Okay, so we've, we've shared a lot of information and I think there's a lot um, that we can, we can take from this, but we wanted to make sure that um, in attending today, there would be some sort of like key takeaways so I've got two questions for our guests that I hope we will have um, really sort of nuggets of, of, of um, takeaways that we can we can go away with and we can work on maybe for September or, or we, we can foster into our thinking for the next academic year. So uh, we'll go in the same order we've gone through all the way so far. So Faye, what one tip would you give to a teacher who's starting a smart school council in, in, a, in a school or a setting like yours and your boys? Focus on your class meetings. Get those started. Get them as a, um, even however regular, two weeks, you know, just get those to become familiar with the boys, or your pupils, sorry. And just, I think that is the most powerful way to start. And then even when it asks you about your actions, just start getting them to write a few things about what they would like to change. And then from there, you can maybe pick up on some interests. And, um, uh, but yeah, I would just focus on your class meetings to get going with. Cool. Thanks very much, Fay. I think that yeah, I think that's a really good piece of advice. Phil, what's yours? Um, I go. I go for um, basically. You're you're the touchstone of all of this, so it kind of all resonates around you. So I would say never say no to anything. So always kind of keep positive around everything, um, and come back with a well. How would we do that? What would that look like if we did that? Um, whose help do we need? So mm. it's kind of converting those conversations, that enthusiasm into how you practically deliver something. You know, I'll just give you an example. If you get a no off a senior leader, then it has been known that the communications team have set up the most cute looking pupil to go in and ask again, you know, at the point of tears that this could actually happen. And it's happened. And you know, the pupils are, are well aware of how to push your buttons. So let them use that for a positive effect ra rather than just for the sake of pushing your buttons to see what happens. You know, let, let them really explore those skills and use them for something positive. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like that. I think that's great advice. Uh, and, and particularly the phrasing there about pushing buttons because you know, young people are very good at that, aren't they? And you're right, that can be harnessed. Okay, so we've got one other question now. Um, before I ask this question of our two guests, uh, when we're, we're, we're finished with this question, we've got a few minutes, I think, for any of your questions that you might have out there. So if you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to have a think about what your questions might be. Post them in the comments if you have them for us to be able to respond to, uh, and we'll, we'll spend some time doing that. So. But before we get there, to give you some time to think about that, and second sort of bit of, of, of gold to take away, uh, in your experience, Faye, uh, what can teachers do more of to include the quietest, I guess, more marginalised voices? It is, and I think, I mean, we're, I've been really lucky that I've just sort of seen in the last few weeks that I've been teaching different pupils that I never would have taught because of them all coming in at different times. And just... I just have to have those moments where on a walk or sometime you just have that chance to find out something that they're interested in. And as soon as you find something that they're interested in, then you're, you're in. And whether you can, you know about it or not, they'll love telling you about it. And yeah, as you say, if it's anything from, you know, on the walk last week, I found, you know, the love of uh, chicken Kiev, my boy, and, you know, and that sort of actual passion for food and to, you know, and then you say, actually, you know, we do like, he might have, that sort of link towards maybe a tuck shop or doing something that he has an interest in and um, it's just having those little uh, moments of like hearing about what they're interested in and then using that. Nice, I would definitely get involved in the chicken Kiev chat if that was yeah. for sure, I'd be, I'd be up for that. Um, a same question to you then Phil. Oh, that's a really good question, I'd be, I'd be asking the pupils it. So 
it's, it's how do you use everything as an opportunity, I guess, to be able to access it. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a white middle-aged man. What do I know about including the most uh, vulnerable children in society? You know, I'd be asking the people that are in that position to say, what more can we do for you? What are we missing? How can we improve what we're doing? You know, and I, and I think it's that cultural shift, isn't it, from going from pretending that we know the answer to everything to working out actually there are other people that are best placed to be able to answer some of the most difficult questions in society. Mm. And that, that's fundamentally what lies at the bottom of all of this. It can make a radical change into the lives of these young people, but it can't do it without them. We've got to be included within it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's about giving them the opportunity to do that, isn't it, Phil? Um, that's what our, our, our role is and our responsibility is to make sure that we're giving them the opportunity to do that and, and shape the, the world and the environment around them through doing it. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with more of that either. Um, so we are, uh, we're up to, or just over our time, uh, but I've got I guess if we have any questions, we can take them now. I haven't seen anything come through. Um, so let me just bring Greg in for a second. Is there anything that you have seen in the comments, Greg, or anything that you want to highlight uh, before we finish? Um, I don't think so. I think there was the, you know, there's, there's been, um, there's been comments around just how great it is to hear from Faye and Phil, which uh, I agree with. Um, and I hope everyone's found that, that useful. I, I find it really interesting that in, in, in kind of proofs or you know SEN schools that actually the ethos that we have of kind of just involving everyone is is, is just a bit lot it's a lot easier for for for, for SEN schools or proofs to, to get on board with for some reason um, compared to mainstream I don't know I think we sort of I think that ethos is just much more like you say Faye, when you tried to sell that to your staff they were like yep yeah, cool that makes sense I, um, yeah why would we disagree with that um, so yeah, I was really fascinated in in hearing the sort of practical some of the practical changes that you've made to make it really really work in your setting. So I thought that was fantastic. Sorry, that wasn't a summary of questions, Sam. That was just me saying that was great. Uh, that's fine. You're allowed to do that. Uh, I think it was a valuable thing to hear. So thanks, Greg. Um, okay, folks. So I think that is our time. Um, if you want to get in touch with us for any reason, uh, the, this is the way in which you can do so. We've made a recording of today's uh, CPD. Um, if you'd like it to revisit it, please just drop us an email on the email you see there uh, and we will get that sent over to you. Um, uh, Greg has shared the... Um, the class meeting tool if you would like to have a little play around with it and get to know it if you if you aren't used to it you've not seen it before uh, and greg could you also pop our twitter in uh, the comment box if you haven't already done so um as another way of yeah interacting with us as, as a small charity we, we love to hear from from teachers no matter what setting you're in or what what you're up to um and yeah so please please feel free to do that um so yeah that's it from all of us uh phil looks like you were about to catch the train mate you've had enough you're oh, no, I've got, I'm, I'm the only person but this is Oldham now. Everybody in Oldham has gone for their summer holidays. Can I, can I wish everybody a lovely summer if you get one this year? Yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, same from, from us here at Smartful Council as well. Uh, have a great summer uh, if you are taking it soon. It's uh, very well deserved and um, I'm sure that we'll all sort of have opportunities to, to interact again in September, even if we're not exactly sure yet what that's going to look like. So yeah, thank you very much from, from us uh, four and for everybody else for joining today. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Guys. See you again Cheers. soon. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.